Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And the subject of this podcast is going to be where have all the leaders gone? Where have all the leaders gone? And what I mean by that is we're going to ask some questions about why, when you look around the world stage or even closer to home in our backyard or in our jobs or lives or wherever, it seems like the qualities of leadership that used to be so common have almost entirely vanished. Why is that? Well, first, is it even true? We'll take a look at that question and see what we can make of it. But I wanted to do a podcast on this subject because on Twitter a few days ago, I put out a tweet and it said something to the effect that when you look around the world today, it doesn't seem like we have any leaders of the same caliber that you had in previous eras, generations or centuries. And why is that? First of all, is it true? Because sometimes we can get a very skewed perspective of things just by assuming that our own judgment is in any way indicative of larger trends. And if it is true, why is it true? So let's look at this question. Where have all the leaders gone? Well, when you look around the world today, and my my comment really was based on just a, a, a survey, a brief survey of the major world leaders or the major powers, and even the second second tier powers it just doesn't seem that there's any leader of of top-notch ability and character and 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 that that intangible presence of, of charisma that we used to have say you know 50 60 70 80 90 years ago and going back even farther and i think that that is a true statement I think that it's not something that we're imagining. I don't think it's something that's just an illusion. I really do believe that the qualities of of character and moral rectitude and and decisiveness and initiative and the the ability to follow through with a plan, with a stated objective, with just ruthless determination, seems to have gone. It seems to have gone. And I think there are some... Some reasons for that, some of them are maybe unavoidable, some of them I think are preventable. But I think as we go down the list, I think the first and most obvious thing, I I just think the way the news and the communications technology has developed now with instant communications, internet, mass media, instantaneous communication. You've got a a news cycle that's literally nonstop. Every single second, every millisecond of every day is now co-opted by this unrelenting news cycle. And what that means is that the average person who in previous eras would have just followed through and done what he was told now feels like he's constantly subjected to this bombardment of information. And it seems to him or her that something always needs to be done. Some new thing always needs to be done. It's just very, very difficult now with the instantaneous news cycle for any leader to set a path and follow through with it. Because when you want to be a great leader, you can't just respond to the whims of the moment. You can't just lurch off in some new direction every every two days. You have to have the ability to stay the course and to follow a plan of action that may take years or even decades. And people just don't have that kind of patience anymore. They expect instant fixes for everything. And that ties into my second point, which is this instant gratification culture that we have. People want to feel good all the time. They want to feel good all the time. They expect a leader to somehow tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. They need to, they they, they want to be, they want to be entertained. 
That's the third point. They want leadership now has almost become this substitute for entertainment where the led think that the leader needs to be their, uh, you know, their, their uh, organ grinder monkey, that they should just do what we say and that they should respond to every whim and that they should just be there to, um, to mollycoddle us. So I think, I think those are the, the external, the, the sort of the social technological factors. But also, I think, I think there's a very, very strong correlation also in the lack of moral training, the lack of character that we see, not just in leaders, but in just in society in general. In previous eras, you had men who were, what I would say, forged in fire, men that had served in, in uh, hostile uh, military zones, who had been in wars, who had uh, endured personal struggles, severe personal struggles, maybe came from disadvantaged backgrounds. And all that seems to be gone now. What you have now are, are these half men and these half women who are occupying positions of power, who seem to think that it's more important to be a bureaucrat or a technocrat than it is to be a leader. They just don't have the same caliber. They don't have the same fiber. They were not made from the same steel. Whereas the leaders of old had their steel folded and, and hammered 500 times in a red hot forge. The ones that we have now are basically just sort of the inferior slag of the metallic residue in the forge if we can use that analogy, if we can make that analogy. They just don't have the same substance. And I'm going to avoid the temptation to bring up specific names because the minute I do that, some people are going to say, well, no, he's really all right. He's really great. He's really doing this. He's doing that. You know, okay, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make broad generalizations and I'll let you fill in I'll let you fill in the rest. What I'm speaking of are the leaders of the, you know, the Americas and Western Europe. Americas and Western Europe. Those are the people that I'm referring to. And I'm just not seeing, I'm not seeing the same caliber of, of man or woman because many of the European states are uh, led by women, prime ministers who are women. And even they, um, I, I have no problem with, um, absolutely no problem at all with what gender a leader is. I mean, there, there have been kings and queens uh, for, for centuries. It doesn't matter to me. What does matter, though, is are they tough? Are, are, they, are they people of, of character? Are they, uh, you know, are they just jello backs or, or are, they, are, are they technocrats? Are they bureaucrats or are they leaders? Because I think uh, another point is I just don't think that the young people are receiving the character training, the training in character and moral development that they may have gotten in the educational eras of the past. And you know I'm, I'm working very hard to try to do my part to inject or revive some of that character and moral training just through some of these translations that I've done, uh, which used to be part of a standard school curriculum, which at least exposed people to exemplars, to a normative standard upon which they could model themselves. But now there's nothing. There's nothing. There's literally, literally nothing. Now it's the message is everything is relative. Nothing matters. Uh, let's just stuff the brains of the student with facts and everything else will take care of itself. Well, no, it won't take care of itself. It's not going to take care of itself because information and knowledge that is unmoored by the sturdy cords of character and moral training uh, is worthless. Knowledge is worthless without some rudder, without some guiding principle behind it without good character behind it. 
And you only get that from training and experience. It has to be taught. It has to be taught. Yeah, you can sort of learn a little bit. You can sort of pick it up, I think, here and there. But it's so important that it, it deserves special training like we used to have during the, uh, the classical period and also in the Renaissance and also in the early modern period, but which in the 20th century somehow vanished. And there's reasons for that that go beyond the scope of this podcast, but uh, it's pretty clear that we've lost something in the educational system. And finally, I think the major reason for the lack of good leadership in the West, I think it's, it's this sort of lack of external challenges. I think all of the societies in Western Europe and, uh, and the North and South, well, more North maybe than South America, but also South America is also subject, subject to this as well. But there's a real lack of external challenges. I mean, how many people now know what it means to go without a meal for a day or two? How many people today know what it feels like to be forcibly removed from their home? Or they know what it feels like to be subject to invasion or occupation, or to know what it's know what it's like to see people die in front of them in in a, a war. Very, very, very few. It's just not part of the experience of the average person now. And when a society enjoys centuries of unbroken ease and comfort, unbroken ease and comfort or I should say generation upon generation of ease and comfort, something is lost. The fiber goes bad. The moral fiber of the people somehow goes bad. People begin to forget what's important in life. They dress up their, their, uh, their corruptions and their uh, desires as virtues, and they hide all of them behind a wall of money. And they try to justify their choices and their, their lifestyles based on whatever rationale suits the moment. That's the, that's the game. That's the game that we're playing right now. The game that we've been playing for many, many decades now. Now, all of this is going to end at some point. You mark my words. All of this is going to come to a shuddering halt at some point because it has to. And so... That's one dimension of the equation, is that there, there are these, these technological and social incentives that prevent good leaders uh, from arising. There's also the lack of moral training. But, but also, I will say this, this, the situation is not all dark. The situation is not all bleak. So my, the last point I want to make is, there are good men out there. There are good leaders out there. There are, there are good men. There are, are good women. But the problem is you don't notice them in peacetime. They don't make themselves apparent. They don't manifest themselves until the, until the balloon really goes up. Until bad things really do happen, you don't hear about them. You don't hear about them. And history tells us that this is true. For example, for example, many of the officers who became great commanders, uh, at least in America, in, in the Second World War, were not uh, were not what I would call very well known. They 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 had sort of languished in obscurity. Uh, one that jumps uh, jumps uh, you know comes to mind is is uh, is Eisenhower. Now he wasn't entirely obscure. He was he was well known as a uh, I think it's a very competent administrator, but it really was the war that catapulted him into the limelight. The, he, he was noticed by a couple people, uh, and he really came into his own. And maybe the most extreme example that I can think of is, is uh, U Ulysses S. Grant, U.S. Grant, who, before the Civil War, this guy was uh, nearly destitute, reduced to selling firewood in the streets of St. Louis and having to pawn his watch just to buy Christmas gifts for his kids one year, working in his father's tannery. And he despised this work, but he didn't have a lot of options in those days. In those days, the peacetime army really didn't do very much. And, and Grant was the type of guy who needed an external challenge. When he was bored, when he was... Uh, 
you know, when he got restless, that's when his demons caught up with him. And that's sometimes when the, uh, the drink kind of got to him. Not, not always, but it, it did happen. Okay, there's enough, document, uh, there's enough documentation on that to make that a reality. But in any case, the war was really what brought him into his own. And there are many other examples in the First World War, Second World War, probably not just in the United States, but also in all the, all of the belligerent nations. It seems like real leaders just are not needed when times are too good. When times are too good, they're just not needed. They're not appreciated. Their qualities are scary to most people. They're looked upon with nervousness. They make people nervous. But when the shit hits the fan, who do they call? They call the real problem solvers. So that's my, 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 uh, my final point on the subject. There are real leaders out there. They have not all vanished or gone away despite all the social disincentives now that we place in front of them, all the obstacles that we place in front of such people. They are out there, but you just don't hear about them because they're not, they're not exactly the most popular individuals. Let's leave it at that. But you will hear about them when things get bad, when things get bad. And if things get bad and you don't hear from anybody, then you know you're really in trouble. Then you know you're really screwed if, if nobody rises to the occasion. But I, I'm, I'm optimistic enough. I do think that they are out there. But it's just that our media, our political system, our entire culture is just not geared towards appreciating these types of, of qualities. America now has become a, a nation of, of distractions, of entertainment, of, of frivolities. And um, at least in, when it comes to the news and when it comes to the political system. But all of that is going to come to a halt, maybe sooner than we think. And once that does happen, then we will find out who the true leaders are, who were, they, who were the people that were there when times were tough and stuck with it and stuck around. Then we will find out. So that will conclude my podcast for today. This is Quintus Curtius here at Fortress of the Mind. Good night.